Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming um, on this lovely, you know, Thursday afternoon to come indoors and listen to a physics talk. Nerds. <laughs> Uh, I hope that you'll find this entertaining, and if not, at least educational. So uh, a little beginning, how did I get here? Um, I'm from Queens, New York, originally. Grew up in a working class air, uh, neighborhood. I went to a public high school, Bryant High School. Then I went to City College of New York. Uh, for my graduate studies, I went to the University of Chicago, where I got my PhD in physics. I then uh, did a postdoc did some additional research training at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which is out right next to Stanford. After a few years, I had enough of those California winters and moved to the uh, University of Minnesota, where I became a professor and where I've been ever since. I am actually here today because I'm the author of several uh, popular science books. One is The Physics of Superheroes that I'll be talking about today that explains everything from Isaac Newton to the transistor but there's not an inclined plane or pulley in sight. Rather, all the examples come from superhero comic books, and as much as possible, those cases where the superheroes get their science right. The other book, The Amazing Story of Quantum Mechanics, addresses the burning question, we were promised jetpacks and flying cars, and we got cell phones and laptop computers instead. And uh, it details the development of quantum mechanics, which is the foundational science for solid state and semiconductor physics which is the foundational uh, science for all the technology that we enjoy today. More to the point, how did a mild-mannered physics professor become associated with Spider-Man and Superman? Uh, in my day job, I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. So condensed matter is a fancy way of saying solid state physics, semiconductor physics. Experimentalist means I work in a lab as opposed to doing theory. Um, I've done, my research actually goes from the nano to the neuro. We have been studying putting nanoparticles of one type of semiconductor and embedding them in another type of semiconductor in order to find materials that would have superior properties for solar cells or transistors. And also, techniques we developed to study electronic noise in disordered semiconductors, I'm applying with collaborations in professors in neuroscience to study voltage fluctuations in the brain. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today because back in 2001, I created a freshman seminar that was originally titled, Everything I Know About Science I Learned From Reading Comic Books, which my colleagues say explains a great deal. <laughs> now, as I say, this is a real physics class that covers real physics topics. Um, we can learn a lot from comic books if you make various suspensions of disbelief, which we'll be talking about, and I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Uh, one thing you could see right off the bat, this is a comic that I actually bought as a kid uh, because Superman was visiting college campus and I was curious as to what life in college was going to be like. Um, I knew the part with Superman wasn't too accurate, but for the younger members of the audience, there are definitely some things here that are correct. Namely, in college, all professors at all times always wear caps and gowns. <laughs> and all professors are 800-year-old white men. So. <laughs> But anyway, I, I taught this class, it was a success, and then in the spring of 2002, the first Spider-Man movie was going to come out. The one with Sam, directed by Sam Raimi, the first Tobey Maguire one. And I thought, hey, this is a good opportunity to get some science into the newspaper. So I wrote an article about how the death of Spider-Man's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, in, as you all know, Amazing Spider-Man number 121, uh, is a textbook illustration of Newton's laws of motion. And so this article was published in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, an op-ed, uh, my local newspaper, and uh, the university put out a little press release saying, well, Spider-Man's on the big screen, but if you wanna know about the science of superheroes, the person to ask is Jim Kekelius, teaches this freshman seminar, blah, blah, blah. The university has put out press releases about me before, about my work on disordered semiconductors and electronic noise. Result, zero. <laughs> you write one story about Spider-Man, however, and the, the, the article came out on a Friday, the Spider-Man movie opened on Friday. By Monday, there were calls from the BBC, CNN Headline News, the London Times, the Associated Press came to my office 
where I just happened to have those lecture demonstration tools on hand. <laughs> that was a lucky break. Um, and, uh, you know, at this stage of my life, I've reconciled myself to the fact that I could win three Nobel Prizes and I know what photo they're using in my obituary. <laughs> I say this to my colleagues, they say, win three Nobel Prizes, how? On eBay, what? <laughs> but this article actually went around the nation, it actually went around the world. One of the uh, grad students brought back a clipping from Turkey where I think I know what they're saying about me. And then I started showing up in places that physics professors don't usually appear. So, if you're later on this weekend, if you're playing Trivial Pursuit and you get volume six, I'll tell you right now that if you get card 291, the science question, the answer is kryptons. The question is, what planet's gravity did, sci did science professor Jim Kekelius estimate by calculating the force needed to leap over an Earth building in a single bound? Kryptons, yes. <laughs> uh, I didn't even know about this. A grad student brought this to my attention. I borrowed the card. I went down to the, my main department head, uh, office, and I showed it to my department chairman, and I said, Alan, who's the most famous scientist you know? <laughs> and he looked at the card, and he looked at me, and he said, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> the superheroes actually will get their science right more often than you'd think. Now, the superpowers themselves are impossible. And I don't see my job as just being like Dr. No or Professor Grump, saying, well, this could never happen, and uh, this is impossible, and what's the deal with the Hulk's pants anyway? <laughs> Unstable molecules. Um, and so when I say, let's grant each character a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature. Let's say, if you were super strong, or could stretch like a rubber band, or could run at super speed like the Flash here, or Dash from the movie The Incredibles. Could you run across the ocean? Could you run up the side of a building? Could you drag people behind you in your wake? All things that these characters are shown doing, all things that are correct from a physics point of view once you make that suspension of disbelief. Here we see The Flash, a DC comic superhero who can run at super speed. And a crook is shooting at him, but the flash is faster than a speeding bullet. That's not a problem. But what about the innocent bystanders that are in the way? The flash is not super strong. He's not bulletproof. He's just very fast. But we see here, with the sweeping motion, the flash plucks the bullets right out of the air before they can harm them. And there's an editor's note. Flash's action in stopping the bullets is similar to that of a baseball fielder who stops a hot grounder by letting his glove travel momentarily in the same direction as the ball. Now this is correct. This is a correct use of superpowers. Yesterday, I picked up an object going 600 miles per hour when I poured myself some ginger ale on the airplane. It's going 600 miles an hour, I'm going 600 miles an hour, no problem. If I'm standing still and it's going 600 miles an hour, then I have a problem. So this is some correct science uh, in a, from a comic book. Here we see actually another example from The Flash. I love this. Um, the Flash has something wrong with his hands so that if he touches you, you would die. Don't ask. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But he wants to stop a crook, but he doesn't want to kill him. So what does he do? He runs a half a mile away to a pear orchard. And he runs around the orchard, tr the trees, the pear trees, and he shakes the pears off of the branches. Then. By running back swiftly, he creates a suction, thanks to the Bernoulli effect, and he drags the pears after him. And at the last second, he ducks down, and the pears' inertia can carry on, knocking the crook out, thereby demonstrating Newton's third law of motion, which is usually expressed for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, or as I like to phrase it, forces come in pairs. <laughs> All right, I heard some groans. So I need to remind you that I am a teacher. Therefore, your hatred only makes me stronger. <laughs> let, me, let me talk about some real, let me give you a little physics lesson uh, regarding Spider-Man and the um, example that was published in the newspaper that led to this, this wild adventure for me uh, that led to me talking to you here this afternoon. 
So Spider-Man and conservation of momentum, or the question of what killed Gwen Stacy. Spider-Man created in 1962 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Peter Parker, a high school science student, is bitten by a radioactive spider, does not get radiation poisoning and die, but rather gains a set of fantastic powers with which he fights crime as the amazing Spider-Man. The story that I want to talk about was published in 1973. And in the story, the Green Goblin, one of Spider-Man's foes, has kidnapped Gwen Stacy, Spider-Man's girlfriend, and brought her to the top of the George Washington Bridge in order to lure Spidey into battle. During the fight, Gwen is knocked off the top of the bridge and falls to her apparent doom. Spider-Man shoots his webbing down after her and manages to catch her at the last moment, but those with good eyes will see a little snap sound effect by her neck that's going to have bad consequences in a moment. He brings her back up to the top of the bridge where he discovers to his horror that she is in fact dead even though he caught her at the end. And this is, uh, was a big deal in comic books at the time, and actually still is. Um, this happened 40 years ago. It was the first time that a innocent bystander and a long-standing recurring character died when the hero and villain fought. And it's also very significant because it's been over 40 years and Gwen Stacy is still dead. Uh, in the comic books, no matter how you die, you eventually get better, but Gwen belongs to this small select group of characters who have never really recovered. And right away, the go a, a controversy brews up where the goblin starts taunting Spider-Man. He says, romantic idiot, she was dead before your webbing reached her. A fall from that height would kill anyone before they struck the ground, which if this were true, the implications for bungee jumpers or skydivers would suggest somebody's not telling us the truth about something. But it's been a long recurring controversy among comic book fans. Was it the fall that killed Gwen Stacy or was it the webbing? And in the year 2000, Wizard Magazine, a monthly magazine for comic book fans, listed this as one of the great open questions comparable to who's faster, Superman or The Flash? The flash. <laughs> but anyway, we can use physics to actually address the death of Gwen Stacy. We'll use Newton's three laws. For every, if an object's in uniform motion with no net force on it, there's no change in its motion. If there is a net force, then the change in motion is given by force equals mass times acceleration. And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, or forces come in pairs, which we now know. We could do a little calculation. We'll say distance. First, we want to figure out how fast she's going when the webbing reaches her. We'll say distance is average speed times time. That's, that's a pretty straightforward equation, right? If I drive for an average speed of 60 miles an hour and I drive for an hour, I've gone 60 miles, right? Now, what do I use for the average speed, though? Because she starts with a speed of zero and she accelerates due to gravity. Well, if I have stu two students in my class, one gets a grade of zero, one gets a grade of 100, the average grade is 50. So I'll just take the two, two limiting velocities, divide by two, that'll be the average velocity. So, and the acceleration, g, determines that's a constant acceleration, and that will set the time. That will figure out how long it takes to go from zero to a final velocity v. I do a little bit of algebra, and I find that the velocity squared is two times g times the height the, of the tower in which she falls, the distance she's fallen. So if I guess that the height of the tower is about 300 feet, and then I went back and looked it up, the towers are actually 600 feet, so he caught her halfway down. The acceleration due to gravity is 32 feet per second per second. I look up the value of two on Wikipedia and <laughs> plug the numbers in, and I find that when the webbing reaches her, she's going nearly 95 miles per hour. Now, if you neglect air resistance, which we always do in these freshman physics problems, <laughs> how much force would the webbing have to exert to stop her, say in half a second? Well, we'll use force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity over time. I'll bring the time over, so I have force times time is mass times change in velocity. The mass times velocity is the momentum, which in physics is represented by the letter P because it stands for momentum. <laughs> We're rocket scientists. 
Well, I know her change in velocity. She's going 95 miles an hour. She has to come to rest, so she has to stop zero mile per hour. Let's say her mass is 50 kilograms, which means that she'd weigh 110 pounds, which seems about right. If the webbing stops her in half a second, then the force it has to exert is 1,100 pounds, or equivalently, it's a deceleration of 10 Gs. And this is the part that doesn't require suspension of disbelief. You tell someone they were going 95 miles an hour, you stop them in half a second with a force of 10 Gs, and you say, yeah, and they die. <laughs> and this is why we have airbags in our automobiles. You're going 60 miles an hour and you hit something and the car stops. But you keep going forward because an object in motion remains in motion until acted upon by an outside force. That outside force is coming up in a moment. It used to be provided by either the steering column or the windshield. Those are very rigid, so the time of interaction is very short, so the force is very large. Airbags do two things. They spread the force over a larger area, so the pressure, force per area, is reduced, and they deform under contact. They give a little bit. Look, it's the collision, and what's gonna happen to you is governed by that equation. You're going 60 miles an hour, you're gonna go to zero because you hit something. You don't want that, you shouldn't have hit something. Your mass doesn't change. Well, that's the best case scenario, really. That's what we're shooting for, that your mass stays the same. So that part is governed by the collision. All you can really do is change on the left-hand side, and if you could, the biggest knob you can vary is the time. And if you go from one millisecond to three milliseconds to stop you, that doesn't sound like very much, but that's three times longer time, which means three times smaller force is needed to have the same change and a force that would have been lethal now will merely knock you unconscious. So sadly, the same physics that saves our lives in automobile crashes was responsible for the death of Gwen Stacy. I wrote an article about, a letter about this. I sent it to Wizard Magazine. They published it. They said, see, physics shows it was the webbing and not the fall that killed Gwen Stacy. A few years later, in Peter Parker's Spider-Man, number 45, the Green Goblin is still taunting uh, Spider-Man over the death of Gwen Stacy, but now he's changed his tune. Now he says, I tried to save poor Gwen, but before I had a chance to reach her, Spider-Man did something incredibly stupid. Despite the speed of her fall, he chose to catch her in that rubber webbing of his. In the next instant, her neck was snapped like a rotten twig. So, it had taken 30 years but at least now the Green Goblin realizes that it wasn't the fall that killed Gwen Stacy, but was in fact the webbing. I don't know how well I do with my students or the readers of my book or with you here all this afternoon, but if I can teach a homicidal maniac like the Green Goblin about physics, then I'm making a difference. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>